Good morning, everyone. Alrighty, I'm back. Good morning again to all of you. Could you turn your Bibles to, I'm going to start you off, though we're going to start a new series in Ephesians. I want you to go, to, first of all, to Acts chapter 18, verse 18. 
Acts 18, 18. And we're going to begin a new series. And I'm very excited to, to, uh, to do this series on Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. A great, great, great epistle. And uh, uh, like a lot of people, it's uh, one of my favorites. And uh, of course, I love them all after I've done them. <laughs> but this book is very, very, uh, it's fantastic. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. And uh, Paul's epistles are always fun to do. And uh, so we're going to learn a lot about the plan of God's spiritual life. We're going to talk a lot of things in this epistle. And today we're going to start off uh, by beginning uh, noting an introduction. Uh, this introduction, let's see, I look at my note, uh, my uh, my files here. Let's see, as far as the introduction, yeah, it'll be an eight-hour uh, series, this particular introduction. It'll be eight hours. And then we'll start the verse-by-verse -verse study of Ephesians. And so this introduction, I always do this in an introduction, and I do it in, in my exegesis and exposition of the different books of the Bible. Um, I always do an introduction, and the introduction is very important because it, um, it discusses various things that are important to interpretation. So uh, what we'll see in our introduction, you know, a little bit of an outline for our introduction for Ephesians, we'll be loading today, canonicity. And then on Thursday, the authorship of this epistle, which has been disputed by some, and especially in modern times, not in ancient times, and for two, basically for 18, uh, 1900 years, nobody really uh, uh, argued about the authorship of Ephesians. It's a modern phenomenon. And then we have who are the recipients of this letter, which is going to be, very significant, uh, as we'll see, and uh, because it's written to the, it's addressed to the Ephesians. But uh, we'll talk about this. There's a little bit of a textual issue there, and uh, what we're going to find out is it's actually a circular letter, like First John. Those of you who studied First John with me, interestingly, John, First John was written to those seven churches of Asia. We saw in the book of Revelation that he wrote to, or Jesus had him write to. And then I believe that uh, 1 John and Ephesians were circular letters, and a lot of people are in agreement with me on that. That didn't originate with me. Then we'll note the place of origin. Where did Paul write this from? And then we'll note the date, and then which is connected to the place of origin, as we'll see. And then we're going to note the literary genre. I was discussing this with a, 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 man, a Christian man, a great guy, and uh, at a uh, cigar shop, we were talking... Uh, about uh, the Bible and interpreting the Bible, and he, he, uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. He had a lot on the ball, and uh, so we were talking about literary genre and interpreting uh, the Bible. So it's very important to understand the literary genre that you're studying and the type of uh, literary uh, literature you're uh, reading in order to interpret correctly. So uh, literary genre is uh, very important, and uh, then we'll be noting the form and structure of this letter. It's actually pretty easy to outline, in, in my opinion. I think most people would say it is. So we're noting the form and structure of the letter and uh, and then the purpose of it, which is uh, really difficult for a lot of, it's great expositive, it's, it's, it's a troubling thing. What is exactly the purpose of this particular epistle? Is there one primary purpose or there are multiple purposes? What is the purpose? And I, I'm going to do my best to try to nail it down for you, which I think it's uh, the purpose is really found in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, the beginning of it, and when the the app the application of the letter, he starts talking about application. Starts talking about the the imperatives and the prohibitions uh, in chapters four, five, and six. After giving the indicatives of the Christian faith in the first three chapters, and then we'll be noting the major themes of this epistle. So we'll be talking about the major themes. There's a lot of great things in this epistle, and I'm really, as I said before, very excited about uh, teaching this particular book. And so right now, you should be at Acts 18, 18. We'll be there momentarily. And let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're in fellowship with God because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. That restores us the fellowship with the Holy God, our Heavenly Father, and the Son and the Spirit. But now we need to maintain it. And we do that by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. They're, they're synonymous uh, because they both bear the same results if you look both at both passages. And that should be the case because the Spirit inspired the Scriptures. So Paul's emphasis with the Ephesians is the Spirit's role in their fellowship with the Trinity. 
And then in a Colossians, Paul's emphasizing with the Colossian Christian community the uh, importance of the Word of God in relation to their fellowship with God and the triune God. And so if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us so graciously, another day to study your almighty word. We thank you, Father, for the completed canon of Scripture, and we thank you for the great modern translations that we have, and we thank you for the men and women that have been involved in these translation committees for these great modern translations that we have. I thank you for that. I thank you for them, and I also thank you, Father, for uh, the freedoms that we have in this country, and I just thank you for... Uh, the president and the executive judicial legislative branches of our, of our federal, state, local governments and military, and also those in COVID operations, paramilitary organizations like the police departments and uh, the fire departments. We just thank you for each and every one of these individuals. We pray, Father, that you would raise up uh, people in our in various areas of our government and military and pa paramilitary organizations that have a love for your word, that have positive volition to the word of God, and or have establishment principles as non-Christians. Um, I just thank you for them all, and I just pray, Father, you give our leaders again the wisdom and moral courage to lead this country. I also thank you for the great plan that you revealed to us in your word by the Spirit, Father, and I just thank you for electing and predestinating us to, the, to be conformed to the image of your Son. We thank you for the great sacrifice of your, uh, sacrificing your Son at the cross of Calvary, uh, and his great sacrifice and suffering your wrath in our place so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God, your wrath in the lake of fire forever. We thank you for that great love that you demonstrated to us. We thank you, Father, for the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of your Son at your right hand, which uh, provides us our so great salvation and delivers us from eternal condemnation, enslavement to sin and Satan and its cosmic system, personal sins, condemnation from the law, uh, physical and spiritual death. Thank you for these, this great uh, deliverance that you provided for us through your Son, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives and through regeneration to resurrection, and we thank you for him through the baptism of the Spirit, identifying us with your Son and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at your right hand, giving us the victory now positionally and uh, and also over, if, in, in giving our, our salvation and sanctification in a positional sense and also uh, in a perfective sense when we're in a resurrection body at the rapture of the church, and also an experiential sense when we appropriate by faith our union identification with your Son. And so, Father, we just pray that you would bless us in this study of the, of the book of Ephesians. I pray today that you would help me by the part of Spirit to communicate uh, the subject of the canonicity of Ephesians with accuracy and clarity, reverence, and respect, and power, so I can minister to your people and uh, help them to understand this book. I pray that you would work mightily and powerfully through your people and help them to understand this discussion of the canonicity of Ephesians and this introduction before we begin the verse-by-verse -verse study of the book. I pray you help them through the Spirit to understand and learn and apply and concentrate and, and break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. I also pray for the technology and thank you for the technology and the people taking advantage of it. I pray there will be no problems with the recordings, the video and the audio and uploading these things to our various websites, podcasts, the media platforms that you've given to us. And uh, I just pray, Father, that thank you, Father, again, for the technology and protect it from the evil one and use it mightily, Father. So, Father, we pray for this service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, your Son, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen. If you haven't turned there already, please go to Acts chapter 18, verse 18. And uh, as I said before, we're noting an introduction to this letter before we do the verse-by-verse uh, exegesis and exposition of the book. And as I said before, the opening prayer and the introduction, uh, we'll be noting, uh, first of all, this little uh, outline that I put together. First of all, we'll be look, new, doing the canonicity of the letter today. Then we'll be doing the authorship. This will be followed by the, uh, noting who the recipients of this letter are. And then we'll be noting the place of origin. Where did Paul write this from? We'll note the date. When did he write this? 
and also the literary genre, what type of literature are we studying with Ephesians. We'll be noting the form and structure of this epistle, and then we'll be noting the purpose of this letter and uh, in, 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 our, in this introduction. And then lastly, we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at the major themes of this epistle. And also, I, I also think in my, uh, yeah, we'll be noting um, the grace and peace that's uh, introduction that's in, in this letter as well. And uh, it's significant and uh, the significance of it. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing in the introduction. I, I, I do this because it's uh, so that we can interpret it correctly. So all the things I'm going to be noting in this introduction are definitely directed toward a, a proper interpretation of the letter. I, I do an introduction with all my uh, studies and any book I've studied in the Bible, I always do an introduction, whether it's when I'm writing on it or um, you know, teaching on it in a face-to-face -face manner or online. So that's very important because we want to, if we, we can't, people talk about application, they want to talk about application all the time, especially in America, uh, but they're not, and, and I know why that is because a lot of times it's all about me. We have a, we're a very narcissistic culture, especially in the church now with the apostasy in the church. When I say by narcissistic, we're all narcissists in the sense because we're all sinners by nature and practice and sinners are nat by nature and practice are all narcissistic and all everything else that you want to, you know, whatever psychological term you want to coin it, God calls it being enslaved to sin and Satan. And so uh, when the church rejects the word of God, uh, then they're living in their flesh, not in what the, according to what the Spirit is teaching. Uh, and God will discipline believers that do that on a habitual basis. But we see that uh, we need to, uh, you know, a lot of, we talk about application, but that a lot of times that's because people in the church, it's all about them. They, they, instead of learning about God, they want to know, help me out. And it's nothing wrong with wanting to learn how to help uh, deal with your problems, but it all starts, first of all, who is God? What is God? What does he do? What has he done for us in the past? What is he doing for us now in the future? It's not always all about us. In fact, most of the time it should be about God and others. So we see that uh, the, we, get to, we can't apply the word of God until we properly interpret the text. And that's what the introduction is going to help us do. Interpret the text so now we can get to application. How does this apply to us here in the 21st century in America and uh, in the church. So uh, I, I got, you know, you know, we talk about the book of Acts. If you look at my notes here, we'll be there in a second because we're going to note the, uh, the third missionary journey of Paul, which resulted in him returning to Ephesus. He was there in his second missionary journey, but he didn't stay there. But uh, he did return in his third missionary journey to Ephesus. So during his second missionary journey, the apostle Paul uh, which that third missionary journey was between 49 and 52 AD approximately. And during that second missionary journey, he stopped at Ephesus. Now he was urged to stay by the Ephesians, but declined. Aquila and Pris Priscilla, as well as Timothy, continued the work of the Lord in Ephesus according to Acts 18, 18 through 21, while Paul uh, himself sailed to Antioch. However, Paul did return to Ephesus during his third missionary journey and stayed there for three years, according to a comparison of Acts 19 and Acts chapter 20, verse 31. And from there, Paul went to Jerusalem where he met many Jewish, uh, Jews zealous for the law and they attempted to kill him because they erroneously assumed that he brought Trophimus, an Ephesian Gentile, into the inner temple courts. That's recorded for us in, in Acts 21 and specifically Acts 21, 29. However, as we can see from that account in Acts, the, the Romans intervened and thus spared Paul's life from the mob. However, as a result, he was imprisoned in Caesarea for two years. That's according to Acts 21, 15 to Acts 26, 32. And eventually, uh, he was sent to Rome as a result of appealing his case to Caesar, which he had the right to do because he was a Roman citizen. And so he remained under house arrest for another two years before his release, according to Acts 27, 1 to Acts 28, 31. And so this incarceration took place between 60 and 62 AD. And this period is uh, Paul's life is identified by expositors and scholars as his first Roman imprisonment. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 20, excuse me, Acts chapter 18. Look at verse 18. I'm reading from the Net Bible. At Paul, after staying many more days in Corinth, said farewell to the brothers and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, he had his hair cut off at uh, Sancria because he had made a vow. And when they reached Ephesus, Paul left Priscilla and Aquila behind there, but he himself went into the synagogue and addressed the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he would not consent. But he said farewell to them and added, I will come back to you again if God wills. 
Then he set sail from Ephesus. And when he arrived at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church at Jerusalem and then went down to Antioch. And after he spent some time there, Paul left and went through the region of Galatia and Phrygia and strengthening all the disciples. And so uh, now he goes on to say, and it um, goes on to say in uh, um, verses 24 and through 28 is the account of uh, Apollos and, uh, and, uh, and, and his, uh, in his uh, encounter with Priscilla and Aquila. But I want to skip over that because it's not related to my Paul's third missionary journey. So let's look at Acts 19, verse 1 now. So it says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples there. So he had set off from Antioch, Paul did. He left from Antioch, as we saw, and then he went back to Ephesus. And I'll show you on the map his route. So verse 19 Chapter 19, verse 1, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul went through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, and he found some, some disciples there. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul said, and to what then were you baptized? And to John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is G- in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. And now there were about 12 men in all. So Paul entered the synagogue and spoke out fearlessly for three months. He always did this, went to the Jew first in the synagogues and then to the Gentiles. So Paul entered the synagogue, verse eight, and spoke out fearlessly for three months, addressing and convincing them about the kingdom of God. But when some were stubborn and refused to believe, reviling the way, that means Christianity, before the congregation, he, the Jewish congregation, he left them and took the disciples with him, addressing them every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all who lived in the province of Asia, which is now Turkey, both Jews and Greeks heard the word of the Lord. So there he is, went to both Jew and Gentile. Then it says in verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by, by Paul's hands. This is in Ephesus. So that when even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his body were brought to the sick, their diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. But some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were possessed by evil spirits, saying, I sternly warn you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, seven sons of a man named Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. But the evil spirit replied to them, I know about Jesus and I'm acquainted with Paul, but who are you? And then the man who was possessed by the evil spirit jumped on them and beat them all into submission. And he prevailed against them so that they fled from that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Fear came over them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. And many of those who had believed came forward, confessing and making their deeds known. Large numbers of those who practiced magic and collected their books and burned them in the presence of everyone. And when the value of the books was added up, it was found to total 50,000 civil coins. And this way, the word of the Lord continued to grow in power and to prevail. Now, after all these things had taken place, Paul resolved to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia, and he said, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So after sending two of his assistants, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, he himself stayed on for a while in the province of Asia. At that time, a great disturbance took place concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought a great deal of business to the craftsmen. And he gathered these together, along with the workmen in similar trades, and said, Men, you know that our prosperity comes from this business. And you see and hear that this Paul has persuaded to turn away a large crowd, not only in Ephesus, but in practically all of the province of Asia, by saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. And there is danger, not only that this business of ours will come in disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as nothing, and she, she whom all the province of Asia and the world worship will suffer the loss of her greatness. When they heard this, they became enraged and began to shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with the uproar, and the crowd rushed to the theater together, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, the Macedonians, who were Paul's traveling companions. But when Paul went to enter the public assembly, the disciples would not let him. Even some of the provincial authorities who were his friends sent a message to him, urging him not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing, one, some another, for the assembly was in confusion 
And most of them did not know why they had met together. Some of the crowd concluded it was about Alexander because the Jews had pushed him to the front. Alexander, gesturing with his hand, was wanting to make a defense before the public assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, for about two hours. After the city secretary quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what person is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the keeper of the temple of the great of Artemis and of her image that fell from heaven? So because these facts are indisputable, you must keep quiet and do nothing, anything, do not do anything reckless. For you have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If then Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against someone, the courts are open and their pro let them bring charges against one another there. But if you want anything in addition, it will have to be settled in a legal assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause we can give to explain this disorderly gathering. And after this, he, he said this, he dismissed the assembly. And chapter 20, verse 1, after the sermons had ended, Paul sent for his disciples, and after encouraging them and saying farewell, he left to go to Macedonia. So what a great stay he had in Ephesus, huh? <laughs> Great, the word of God was uh, prospering there, and but with it came persecution. Uh, Satan in the kingdom, uh, in his kingdom, uh, waged an attack against the Christian community uh, through the non-Christian community. As we can see, Paul was taking money out of the pockets of those who were making gods and uh, you know images to be worshipped, and so uh, because of the financial issue there, they uh, attacked Paul and those connected to him, and so. Uh, we see that Paul had a very productive stay in Ephesus. And so this was the place that Paul uh, was, uh, he was writing to the Ephesians, but also, as we'll see, he was not only writing to the Ephesians with this letter, which is entitled Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He's not only writing to the Ephesians, as we'll see in this introduction, but he's actually writing to every, all the Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia. So let's take a look at the map, uh, a map of uh, Paul's journey here. And uh, so uh, this is a, a picture from uh, I get from uh, Logos. Let me just uh, hold on one sec here. Give you a full screen view. All right. So we have here a, 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 a map of uh, the war of the Mediterranean world, and during Paul's third missionary journey, and so we can see here that if you look uh, over here, this is where in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, is what we have is Ephesus, uh, excuse me, Antioch, right here, right in the bottom right-hand corner of the map. So Paul, if you see this red line, this is marking his route. So he goes from Antioch to, Tar to Tarsus, where he was actually born and raised, then to Derby, then he went on, moved on to Lystra and Iconium, then he went up to Antioch and Pisidia, and from there he goes to Laodicea, and from there he hops over to Ephesus. So right here, is Ephesus, and that's where he was. And so, uh, the Apostle Paul, that was his a bit, his base of operations, really, uh, for uh, during his third missionary journey. In fact, the Ephesus was a base of operations for the Christian community for a long time. And once Paul had passed away and was uh, killed by the Romans, uh, we also see that John came in later in life, and he wrote First John, Second, Third John, Revelation, the Gospel of John the last decade of his life, all those works. And uh, his base of operations was Ephesus. We know that from church history. And uh, so he was, uh, he basically, um, uh, Ephesus, he, he, he had his home base in Ephesus like Paul. And, uh, you know, from Ephesus, Paul would send out his guys like Timothy or Ep Ep Epaphras, like to Colossae, which was right near Laodicea, if, if, if you look on the map. So you had, uh, Paul never met the Colossians and uh, Colossian Christian community, but he knew, uh, you know, Epaphras, their pastor. So right, he has Colossae. So he sends from Ephesus, um, Paul does, uh, Epaphras to, from Ephesus to Colossae. And he, he uh, tra evangelized and trains those people there in, Col in the Christian community and, and Colossae. And uh, so when, also interesting is Ephesus and Colossians are written, have a lot of similarities. We'll talk about that. And they also have, um, also, uh, they're written very, uh, in far as time is good, one right after the other, actually, as we'll say. In fact, Philemon was in, involved in that too, a book we did in the past. So those three books were written pretty close to each other in time. 
So that's, this is where Paul, right here, Ephesus, that's where he was, right off the Aegean Sea. And uh, so he, this is where this particular, um, uh, this particular city was the home base of operations for the Apostle Paul. So uh, now I want you to go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. So, again, to review what we noted a few moments ago, during his second missionary journey, which took place between 49 and 52 AD, Paul stopped at Ephesus. Now, he was urged to stay by the Ephesians, but declined, as we just read. Aquila and Priscilla, as well as Timothy, continued the work of the Lord in Ephesus, according to Acts 18, 18-21, while Paul was going to sail to Antioch. We read that as well. However, Paul returned to Ephesus, as we pointed out, during his third missionary journey and stayed there for three years, as we read in Acts 19 and uh, Acts 20, 31. Uh, comparison with that chapter means that Paul uh, indicates that Paul was there for three years in Ephesus. So from there, he went, as we pointed out, to Jerusalem, where many Jewish, Jews zealous for the law attempted to kill him because they erroneously assumed that he brought Trophimus an Ephesian Gentile into the inner temple courts, Acts 21, 29. However, the Romans intervened and spared Paul's life from the mob. However, as a result, he was then imprisoned in Caesarea unjustly for two years, according to Acts 21, 15 through Acts 26, 32. And eventually he was sent to Rome as a result of appealing his case to Caesar, which he had the right to do because he was a Roman citizen, which was very handy for him as he traveled around the, the Mediterranean regions of the world pro proclaiming the gospel. Uh, that Roman citizenship protected him, as we can see from the book of Acts, Acts 16 and Philippians. Uh, it, it, it protected him from the civil authorities. And then also we see that Paul remained under house arrest for another two years before his release. That's according to Acts 27 and 28. And this incarceration took place between approximately 60 and 62 AD. Now, this period of Paul's life is identi identified by expositors and scholars as his first Roman imprisonment, during which uh, time he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians. And this is indicated by three references in his epistle to his imprisonment. Ephesians 3, 1 mentions it. Ephesians 4, 1. And lastly, Ephesians 6.20. Now, throughout the church's history, Ephesians, along with Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, have been identified as Paul's prison epistles. I've done uh, Colossians, Philemon, I've done, I've worked all the way through the book. Philippians, I haven't taught it all the way through. That's a book I'm going to be uh, uh, teaching in, in the future as well. I've done Colossians, done Philemon. So uh, Philippians is another book I want to do in the future. I never finished it when I was at Prairie View. Um, and, uh, and, but I did, I did, I, I've actually done the exegesis and exposition in the original languages for that book a long time ago. And, uh, and so like Colossians and Philemon, Tychicus delivered this epistle to the Ephesians, which is indicated by the contents of Ephesians 621. Now, as we will note, although it was addressed to the Ephesians, this epistle appears to be a circular letter in the sense that it was intended to be read by not only the Christian community in Ephesus, but also it was to be read by the many house churches throughout the Roman province of Asia, which is now called Turkey. So if you look at Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the Net Bible has an interesting, has a note, uh, in the uh, with regards a long note on this uh, particular uh, where it says in Ephesus and the note they have and I'm not going to read the whole thing but I just want to point out something briefly and we'll talk about this in detail when we get to it the earliest the most important manuscripts omit in Ephesus uh, P46 does and so these and they list different manuscripts that uh, uh, that that um, that we have, the best manuscripts we have. And so they, there are many important early manuscripts that omit this prepositional phrase. So they say the earliest, the most important manuscripts omit in Ephesus, yet the opening line of the epistle makes little sense without the phrase. And, uh, and then they go on to say, uh, it makes little sense without the phrase to the saints who are in our faithful, or perhaps to the saints who are also faithful, though with this sense, the uh, usen, the verb there, is redundant and the chi is treated somewhat unnaturally. Then they say also this, what is interesting is Martian's canon list which speaks of the letter to the Laodiceans among Paul's authentic epistles. This coupled with some internal evidence that the writer did not know his audience personally. 
and suggest that the Ephesians was an encyclical letter, a circular letter intended for more than one audience. And I, I, that's as far as I want to go with that. We'll talk about that when we get to it uh, in this introduction. So that is, you know, and then, so there's no personal, you would, since he was in Ephesus for three years, what he's, they're saying, since he was in Ephesus for three years, Paul, you would think that when he wrote this letter that there'd be some personal, you know, hey, how you doing? Like, he, you know, like he, like he did in Romans, you know, say, give my regards to so-and-so. And he does that in his epistle. And, you know, you look at Philippians, but he does, and, or First Corinthians, he doesn't do that. You would think he would because he knew the people there in Ephesus. So why didn't he make any, why didn't he give any personal, you know, regards to people? Why didn't he give a, a shout out to somebody that he knew there? That's very significant. That would, in, in the fact that this in Ephesus doesn't appear uh, in all the, in the manuscript tradition and all the, in the different manuscripts uh, that we have, uh, a lot of them don't have it. And which is, put these two things together and there are other issues too. Uh, it, it, it looks like it was a circular letter. I, I'm not saying it didn't go to L Ephesus, probably went to Ephesus first, actually. And then, uh, as we'll see, and then from there, it would sent, it was made copies of and sent out. And then, you know, Paul left a, a blank there to fill in, you know, to, in, in Eph to Ephesus, to the Ephesians, or in Ephesus, or in Colossae, or wherever he wanted this letter to go in Philadelphia. Uh, the, so he left the space for that to be, I, I don't know. I don't, we're, re we're really not sure about that, but it does look like a circular letter, as we'll see, and I'll present all the evidence for that. And uh, most scholars uh, you know, I, that I know of are, are leading, lean that way because of the lack of personal greetings in the letter. So uh, we see here that uh, although it was addressed to the Ephesians, this epistle appears to be a circular letter or a cyclical letter, as the Net Bible uh, uses the term, uh, in the sense that it was intended to be read by not only the Christian community at Ephesus, but also it was to be read by the many house churches throughout the Roman province of Asia, which is now called Turkey. Now, many years Later, after the death of Paul, the Apostle John's first epistle, as I pointed out to you earlier, was intended for these same churches, and thus a circular letter. It was a circular letter as well as as like uh, Ephesians. So uh, if you look at the map again, uh, let me get my pen out here. You look at the map again, you know, you read the book of Revelation, in Revelation 2 and 3, you have the seven churches of Asia. So you have Smyrna, you have Ephesus, you have Laodicea, you have Philadelphia, what is that, four? Thyatira, Sardis, okay? Pergamum there. Okay, so you see there's there, the seven churches of Asia right in there. So these, in the, so these um, Paul and, and John both, um, you know, they, Ephesus was a base of operations to go out to these seven uh, uh, cities, uh, and had, which had big commu Christian communities. So, when Revelation two and three, when John wrote that, you know the, you know there was, uh, there were, you know very um, big Christian communities in those cities, and so the Lord had a message to all of those ch uh, churches in the Roman province of Asia, and Ephesus was the base of operations for Paul and John. Basically, Ephesus was a, a great place that because yeah it was very eclectic people coming in it was a seaport town, you had all these people coming in and that was great. And so from there, he would, go, he would go to the most population, the biggest population center, like Rome. He'd want to be in the biggest population center. And from there, he could pivot off those big population centers. So he'd do his evangelism, discipling, send guys, train guys, send them out, whether it was Timothy or Titus or Epaphras or whatnot, or Epaphroditus. He, that's how he would work it. And very smart the way he did it. So as we continue on, the absence of personal greetings in, 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 in this epistle to the Ephesians and specific issues and conditions, the absence of these personal greetings and specific issues and conditions supports the idea, as I mentioned a few moments ago, that the Ephesian epistle is a circulatory letter, a circular letter, intended for all the various house churches in the Roman province of Asia. So all those uh, cities that I mentioned before, the seven churches of Asia in Revelation 2 and 3, those chapters, they would have got this particular epistle as well, of course. Now we would expect that Paul's lengthy stay in Ephesus would prompt him to send personal greetings in this epistle. However, this is not the case. So, though Paul never mentions any specific problem or problems taking place within the Christian community in this epistle, it can be inferred from the contents of this letter, as we'll note, that he was concerned that the Christian community remained united experientially through the practice of the command to love one another 
and all that which is involved when obeying this command. And this is indicated by the fact in chapter 4, Paul opens the practical application of his teaching in chapters 2 and 3 by commanding the recipients of the letter to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So it says in Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, and I'm reading from the Net Bible, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So that's what he was, that to me is the purpose of the letter, is to keep the unity. He's writing to Gentile Christians. We know that from chapter 2. If you look at chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 11, therefore remember that you formerly, the Gentiles, See, they're not Jews, he's writing to Jewish Christians, they're Gentile Christians. Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, the Jews, that is performed on the body by human hands, that you were at one time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups, the Jew, Jew and Gentile races, into one, one new humanity, Christ being the head, who destroyed the middle wall of petition, the hostility, when he nullified in his flesh, his human nature, the law of commandments and decrees that condemned us. He did this to create himself one new man out of two, the two races, Jew and Gentile, thus making peace between the two races, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by which the hostility has been killed. And so then he says, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near so that through him, Christ, we both have access, Jew and Gentile believers, and one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, the Jewish Christians. He said, you, you're part of that Jewish uh, remnant that's believed in Jesus. because you, And together they compose the church. And here's why, because you've been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also, you Gentile Christians, are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit, both Jew and Gentile believers. That's why he's concerned about the unity between the two, the Gentile and Christian, Gentile Christian community and the Jewish Christian community. And that's why he says what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I believe that's the, that, that, that is the purpose of the letter, what, he just, what we just read in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Keeping the unity between the two uh, races that are in the church. So, we see that, uh, again, though Paul never mentions any specific problem or problems taking place with the, within the Christian community in this epistle, uh, it can be inferred from the contents of the letter that he was concerned that the Christian community remained united experientially through the practice of the command to love one another and all that which is involved when obeying this command. And again, that's indicated uh, by the fact that in chapter 4, Paul opens the practical application of his teaching in chapters 2 and 3 by commanding the recipients of the letter to maintain the unity of the, of the Spirit and the bond of peace in Ephesians 4.3. So uh, what we have is the indicatives of the Christian faith in the first three chapters. And so he's basically telling you, telling the Christian community, the Gentile Christian community in Ephesus and throughout the Roman province of Asia and the Jews, Jewish Christians, that you're in the first three chapters, you're in union with Christ. You're at crucified, died, buried, raised in sea with him. You've been elected and predestinated uh, to be conformed to the image of Christ as manifest in the fact that you were declared justified through faith in Jesus in time. And so now this is who you are in Christ. And then chapters four, five, and six, he shows them the application of being a child of God in union with Christ. And so, and, uh, and so that's what the, first, the last three chapters are about. So the first three chapters are called the indicatives of the Christian faith. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6, you have the commands or the prohibitions. What is the application now? Is That's what 4, 5, and 6, those chapters are showing the application of the first three chapters. And Paul does this in, in Romans too. He does it in different places in his writings. Pete O'Brien, a great commentator, on Ephesians, he says the following. He says, the letter to the Ephesians is one of the most significant documents ever written. Samuel Taylor Coleridge called it the divinest composition of man. This letter was John Calvin's favorite and J. Armitage Robinson 
later described it as the crown of St. Paul's writings. F.F. Bruce regarded it as the quintessence of Paulinism because it, in large measure, sums up the leading themes of the Pauline letters and sets forth the cosmic implications of Paul's ministry as apostle to the Gentiles. Then O'Brien says, among the Pauline writings, Raymond Brown claimed only Romans could match Ephesians, and I'm agreeing with, with him, as, in, as a candidate for exercising the most influence on Christian thought and spirituality, end of quote. Uh, Grant Osborne, a, tra- a commentator and uh, excellent exegete, uh, he says the following about Ephesians. He says, Ephesians as one of the most difficult books in the New Testament. The material dealing with the mystery of the gospel, the exalted nature of Christ, the apocalyptic events of the last days, and the spiritual warfare against the powers of darkness boggles the mind. The sentences are complex, the background elusive to uncover, and the theological issues discussed as deep as any in Scripture, end of quote. And then Harold Honer, the great Harold Honer, great commentator, he has a great commentator on Ephesians, and uh, he's got several commentaries on it. It's got interesting. And he's got a, he does other stuff. He's done other stuff. He passed away not too long ago, but uh, great commentator. He does a, I love because he's very exhaustive, and that's the kind of guy I like. He goes, he leaves no, or he tries not to leave any un, uh, stone unturned. And so he says the following about the Ephesian letter. He says, the letter to the Ephesians has long been a favorite among Christians over the centuries. It contains the leading themes of Pauline literature, and it expresses Paul's motive for his ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. The ideas in Ephesians represent the crown of Paulinism, or the quintessence of Paulinism, Paulinism, as Bruce said, and uh, and, uh, Brown O'Brien quoted. Then Honer says, the book of Ephesians, presenting an exalted view of the church and its relationship to the exalted Christ, contributed richly to the first century believers' understanding of eternal truths. Its message is just as rich and relevant to today's church. And this is the letter we're going to be studying. We'll probably be in this letter for a couple, uh, I would think for a couple of years. Um, I'm guessing. Um, couldn't tell you. Um, so uh, we'll be in it for a while, probably a couple of years. And uh, it's six chapters long and I'm not going to rush through this book. <laughs> fact, actually, it's interesting, you know, we talk about Ephesians chapter six where he talks about spiritual warfare. I actually did the, do the exegesis and exposition of, of that Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, I think I did. I think I did most, I pretty did, much did that. So uh, I'll be going over it again. And uh, But anyways, that, so it's going to be a fun book to study. All, you know, all these guys of great commentators are, are telling you about the influence of the book and and uh, and uh, how wonderful it is and how it's going to be a great blessing to us. So now I want to wrap up our uh, session today, our lesson today by noting the canonicity of the Ephesian epistle. In other words, did the Christian community regard this epistle as inspired by God or not? And if so, how soon was it acknowledged as being inspired by God? Now, as most of you know have been following me, I'm not only the pastor of Winston Bible Ministries, uh, but I'm also um, the pastor, actually, of uh, Doctrinal Bible Church here in Huntsville, Alabama. And we're at 1215 Russell Street, Northeast, uh, here in, in Huntsville, right off uh, Oakwood. So if you're in the area, come on down. We uh, we teach on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. and then Sunday mornings at 9.30. We usually get out by noon. I do two sessions with a break in between on Sunday. And uh, so on Wednesdays, we just finished off last week a series on canonicity. So uh, we've done it with, I did it with uh, with uh, Western Bible Ministries when I was in Iowa, in Marion, Iowa. We did that book. And then, I just finished it off in Huntsville uh, last week. So if you really want to know the details about canonicity, what that's all about, I would uh, advise you to study that series that we just did. It was a 15-hour series. But the term canon, as we noted in that series, the term canon or canonicity in Christianity refers to a collection of many books acknowledged or recognized by the early church as inspired by God. And canonicity is actually determined by God. In other words... A book is not inspired because men determined or decreed that it was canonical. Rather, it was canonical because God inspired it. It was not the Jewish people who determined what should be in the Old Testament, and it was not the Christian community that determined which Christian literary works would be in the New Testament canon. Therefore, canon inspiration determines canonization. So whether the church or Israel recognized the book was inspired by God, it was inspired by God because God, if God the Holy Spirit inspired it, it's in the canon. 
So if the church in Israel, they just recognize through the spirit, the, the, the fact that these books were, that we have in our New Testament, Old Testament today were inspired by God, that they were, they were not just a human book. They were divine and uh, God was there, the divine author, the Holy Spirit. So inspiration determines canonization, not Constantine or any church council. The church councils, in fact, Constantine just it convened church councils, but he didn't decree anything what's going to be in and what's not. And of course, one of the criteria that the church used to determine if a book was canonical or not, inspired by God, was apostolicity. If it wasn't connected to an apostle, it didn't get in. Like, for instance, you hear in the, in the media about the gospel of Judas or the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Peter. Those are what we call Gnostic documents. They were found in the Nag Hammadi. They're, they're in the Nag Hammadi library. They're found in Egypt, Nag Hammadi. And they were all Gnostic documents from the second century AD. And uh, they were never, the early church fathers, everybody, there's no evidence ever, any found ever any evidence that in the church, uh, that they accepted these books as inspired by God. They're not mentioned. They were not used in the churches. And the, the reason why is they were not connected to an apostle. That's why the Gospel of Thomas never got in. And outside the fact, it also has uh, false doctrine in it. Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Judas, they were never accepted by the early church. And F.C. Bauer came up with a, 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 a theory which has been refuted many times over that the, 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 church, the people who got their books in the New Testament uh, were that faction of Christianity that was the strongest. And the weakest who had those Gnostic documents, they didn't get their books in because the stronger faction, who we call Orthodox today, uh, beat out the heterodox, who the Orthodox call today heterodox. <laughs> so that's no evidence for that either. Bauer just had a theory, and it, it was it's no evidence for it in the early church fathers or in the New Testament. We don't see anything. We have the church fathers' writings, and they don't mention anything like this. You know, Constantine didn't do anything to determine what, what was in, in the book, and it, it, he just called convened a council to get the, because you get to find out, because I want to get this Bible, I want to get our books out there, Christian books out there, the, what we consider inspired by God. I want them to get it out to the, throughout the Roman Empire. So what guy, so we convene the scholars together of the, of the, of the, of the Christian community to get together. What do we, what, what is our, what do we consider can, canonical or inspired by God or, or what's not? So what should we, so that's why those councils came about. So, um, so what we see here is that, um, that, the 20, like Athanasius in 367, his festal letter, he has the 27 books that we have in our New Testament. He had back in the, in 367 AD. In fact, the, uh, the early, a lot of the early uh, churches list some lists of them. And many of them are in our, what we have in our New Testament. Some books took a little longer to be ex recognized throughout the Roman empire. They didn't have modern communications and travel. So it took, took some time for some of the smaller books like Jude or second and third John, which were not as well known to get uh, um, people familiar with them so that they recognize their divine inspiration. Revelation took a little while only because it was apocalyptic literature in much of it and there was no other book in the New Testament like that. And But that that was eventually in. So Eusebius, when you get to Eusebius, the great historian uh, in around the 400 AD area, he he comes out and says, what are the, the what books that we consider inspired by God? They're the same 27 that we have today. And he mentions none, any kind of kind of fight between two factions in Christianity to get one their books in, another get theirs out. There's no evidence for that at all. It's just it's just basically fables. It's just like it's it's not even it's not truth. It's fake news. <laughs> Whatever. It's fake history. That's what I call it, fake history. So therefore, inspiration determines canonization. Canonicity, therefore, is determined authoritatively by God. And this authority is simply recognized by his people. Key word, recognized. That's all we're doing. Now we have, of course, the church had the spirit, which indwells each member of the church to give them discernment as to which books are inspired by God and which are not. Now, with regards to Ephesians, there's no record of the early church questioning the canonicity of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. The disputes about the letter were only pertaining to its destination since some claimed it was originally destined for Laodicea. Now let me interject something. There, in the, it's it's a phenomena of modern times. Paul's writings, all of Paul's writings that we know, that you found, and Hebrews, who the early church in their early list they bundled Hebrews with Paul's writings. Now people say, oh well, Hebrews is different, and it's a big debate for forever. 
I don't think it's really much of anything. I think really if the church who was closest to the apostles and their and their disciples, they would know. And they knew that Hebrews, it appears, by the list, when, by bundling Hebrews with Paul's writings, they believed that Paul wrote Hebrews. And so Paul could write, and people say, oh, the, the, the language is different. Well, he could have used it in Manuensis, probably did. But he also could write any old way you want to write. I mean, look at his vocabulary in the Book of Romans and Ephesians and Philippians. And I mean, I mean he's just could write you whatever way, whoever you're, I'm talking to, I can write to them. He was a brilliant writer. And so, uh, so that for that those reasons, I believe that Hebrews was Paul's writings. But here's my point, what I, what I really want to bring home to you. Paul's writings have never been, the authorship of what we call Paul's writings today and have never been, there's never been any doubt as to these books that we call Pauline or that the church called Pauline. There was no debate. They were Paul. Paul wrote these letters, 13 letters, and then including Hebrews 14. It was until modern times, like in the 20th century and 21st century, that now, amazingly, in academia, in the church, they believe that Paul didn't write for a second Timothy and Titus. I had a conversation with that gentleman down there at the cigar shop last night about this. And it's fascinating to me, but through 2,000 years, you never saw any kind of debate about um, uh, for a second and Timothy and Titus. In fact, Paul's got his name on it. And far as they, they believe it's pseudonymous, this letter, which means that somebody posing as Paul that revered Paul uh, would actually uh, pen the letter, not Paul. That's baloney. There's no evidence for that. First, Paul's got his letter name on the letter, and the church rejected pseudonymous letters. In fact, Paul did. If you read the end of 2 Thessalonians, you read Colossians at the end there, uh, he says, this is my authenticating mark. And because he was concerned about forgeries, people forging his name. That's what the whole uh, Second uh, Thessalonians, with the day of the Lord, somebody came in and said that uh, he was Paul and wrote something to them that uh, the day of the Lord has already taken place. So he was re they didn't accept that. The church, in fact, there's also evidence in the church and the church fathers that they, they excommunicated a pastor who posed himself, who uh, took a, uh, uh, wrote and uh, I, uh, he uh, deceived the church into thinking that he was uh, Paul. Uh, he wasn't doing it. He, he had revered Paul, but he was still removed because they didn't accept pseudonymous writings in the church ever. So it's amazing to me. It just goes to show you, you could be a smart guy and still not get it. <laughs> it's just like ridiculous. The church never accepted, they all accepted the past, uh, first and second Timothy and Titus as being Paul's. It wasn't until modern times where Again, they have their theories, but it's not based upon the evidence. Let's stick, guys, uh, those who are academics, let's stick to what the evidence, the texts say. The church fathers, the Bible itself, not what you think. Or what you, you, know, you know, your theories. Who cares about your theories? Who cares about my theories? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's a waste of time, my theories. What evidence do you have for your view? If you don't have any evidence, you don't really have a legitimate interpretation. And they're off on the first and second Timothy and Titus. Paul wrote them. And the church has never doubted that until modern times. So, there's no record of the early church questioning the canonicity of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. The disputes about the letter were not only pertaining to its destination, since some claimed it was originally destined for Laodicea. Clement of Rome appears to have referred to this letter, as well as Polycarp. Origen considered it as inspired by God and quoted from it, and so did Tertullian, and so did Clement of Alexandria. And it's also, Ephesians is found in two of the earliest lists of canons, as I mentioned before. Uh, it first it appears in Martian's uh, uh, canon, uh, which, who identified it as the epistle to the Laodiceans. We'll talk about that in the introduction as well. Secondly, it appears in the Moratorian canon. We mentioned that in our series on canonicity. Interestingly, Skevington Wood, a commentator, points out the one who compiled this list asserts that Paul imitated John in writing by name to the seven churches, namely Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Galatia, Thessalonica, and Rome. Eusebius of Caesarea categorized Ephesians as homo legemina, or as one of the acknowledged books. Uh, what I mean, We studied this in canonicity. Homo legemina, he means that these books were never disputed, and Paul's books were never disputed by the early church. Yet we got scholars, majority, of, now it's the majority view, amazingly, I almost fell out of my chair when I read that and heard that that they, they don't think Paul wrote those letters. They're pseudonymous. 
And it's just, huh? How do you get that? So I don't want to get, I get, I just get fascinated by that because there's some guys, smart guys that are, I, that I respect that it, like, are you kidding me? So it just goes to show you, you could be a, you could be a, a knucklehead who doesn't have an IQ over room temperature <laughs> like myself and get it right sometimes. <laughs> so the acknowledged books, and then there was Antilegamina, and those were disputed books, but they finally got in. But uh, these books, Homo Legemina, Ephesians was never disputed as being Paul's. That's what Homo Legemina means. And that's what Ces uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, the great historian, said. Now, Athanasius, I mentioned him a few moments ago. He listed it, Ephesians, as one of the accepted books in the churches of the Roman Empire. So the canonicity of this book has never been doubted. The Epistle to the Ephesians appears in P46, one of our earliest documents. Uh, it's a, um, one of the earliest manuscripts, which is usually... Uh, dated by textual critics as written approximately 200 AD. And so that epistle appears in that particular um, manuscript. And therefore, no serious doubts about the Ephesian letters' authenticity have come, come down to us from the church fathers. Well, so, uh, on Thursday, at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, Central Standard Time, we're going to be looking at the authorship of the epistle to the Ephesians. Paul. And we're going to talk about Paul a little bit in his life. And I think you'll enjoy it. And so thank you for joining me. I, I, uh, again, this is just the beginning. And uh, this introduction, again, is uh, to help us interpret the book. We bring up very important issues with regards to this book, canonicity, literary genre, who are the recipients, who are the place, where did, was it written, the date, the literary genre, the form and structure, the purpose of the letter. We're going to go through all that because it's very critical in interpreting this book correctly so we can get to an application. We can't get to application until we interpret it correctly. Know what the text says and then what does it say and then, then we can talk about application. So all these things we're going to be studying in our introduction. So we just scratched the surface in this. Uh, it'll be an eight-hour introduction, introduction. So we just finished off the first hour before we go uh, do our verse-by-verse study of this fantastic book. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson. We'll pick this up again, as I said before, at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time uh, as we continue our study of the book of Ephesians. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray this lesson will be a great blessing to the body of Christ, being built up and edified the members of the body of Christ who are listening in live or through the recordings. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ,